What do you make of this latest leg of the story that some of the victims felt the uh, RAF's investigation into the issue in the first place was somewhat of a, of a whitewash? That is generally what the result is for victims. It's also part of increasing the trauma because they, it takes great courage to come forward and be honest about what has happened. But then the chain of command just stonewalls and people are further traumatized by not being believed and by being humiliated into thinking that they're not of enough value to actually bring the change and to bring the perpetrators to justice. It's part of the toxic masculinity that stops people coming forward because the chain of command is more interested in reputational protection than protection at times of its serving personnel. I'm interested in your take as, as to the sort of scale of, of what's been redacted from, from this uh, investigation. And Deborah, Deborah showed some of that to us uh, just, just mm. a moment ago. If people have lost their jobs where wrongdoing uh, has taken place, should the RAF want to talk about that more or, or because of the nature uh, of the work that they do, specifically in the armed forces, is an extra level of privacy and, uh, and redaction something that is, is reasonable? Is it, is it just a focused area where this sort of approach is legitimate or is it, is it something that they're actually shooting themselves in the foot about if they've, if they've done a proper review and taken the proper actions? Should they make, make that more public? It's part of the problem that we've got. Unless they are willing to be open and honest and demonstrate that perpetrators will be punished, that there will be consequences for such actions, nothing changes. Over and over again, I had women coming forward and telling me that they were afraid that they were going to be set up, that in fact, they were being set up for reputational harm and damage so that when eventually they were sexually assaulted, their reputation was trashed and people would think, oh, well, they're just a slag, they deserve it. We have to deal with this because there is no change. I was looking at this back in 2011, 2010, and I can see no change at all. Every time this happens, the RAF, the Ministry of Defence, they put out a, re a response saying, we take this very seriously, uh, we do not condone this, we uh, pursue this powerfully, and nothing happens, nothing changes. And report after report comes out, and we're seeing the same story. So, so were you looking at this specifically at the Red Arrows, or more broadly in the, the RF, or more broadly still in, in the armed, armed services back in 2011? It was more broadly across the armed forces. And to be honest, the RAF was seen as slightly immune because it's much more of a technocratic service. So your capacity to do the job was very, very important. And therefore, that provided a, a degree of protection. It was much more prevalent within the army. Seeing this coming out of the Red Arrows exemplifies the major problem we've got here, because the Red Arrows is widely respected around the world. What does it say when one of our elite forces is known to be predatory towards its women members. This is not about protecting women in the armed forces. This is about protecting reputation. We have to stop putting reputation before protecting personnel. I, I'm interested, I mean, clearly there's further actions that are required today, which, which you're suggesting anyway, and um, the documentary tonight might, might be going into that in more detail. I'm interested, though, that, that you were saying you were looking into this sort of thing in 2011 when you were on the Defence Select Committee, and, and you said earlier, more, more broadly and generically, that these sorts of things were always shut down very quickly. So did, did you try and raise them on the Defence Select Committee, either with your colleagues on the Select Committee or with the armed forces directly, and, and see it pushed away? No, no, you don't get pushed away. You get told, yes, we're dealing with, we're going to be very robust about this, Part of the problem is the armed forces tend to think 
that you can deal with things with military regulations, that you can use the military system to tackle the problems. What they're not doing is going outside, finding the experts in the fields where they have a major problem and learning lessons. They just toughen up their internal systems and think that that will solve the problem. But when the perpetrator is someone who you probably spent over a million pounds training, the attitude tends to be, well, we don't want to lose that person. We've invested a great deal in them. And the victim is put to one side. The person is given a reprimand, and that's the end of it. But they don't yet change their behaviour. The military needs to go outside, start talking to external experts in this field and learning how to deal with its problems and not thinking that changing military regulations, altering the court martial system will make a difference. The system doesn't work. It isn't tackling this problem and it's time for it to go and talk to the civilian experts take advice, and finally, root and branch, and lead the way, because the UK is not unique in this. Lead the way across NATO and show how we can be honest and truthful about the problems we have and the need to actually tackle this and root out a toxic masculinity mm -hmm. and risks to female personnel who are important to our capacity to meet the number of people we need in our armed forces. Currently, we're taking people from the front line and mm -hmm. sending them into, re into uh, military settings so that we can actually recruit people into the armed forces. You're not Madeline. going to recruit when it's dangerous. Thank you. Madeline Moon, thanks for joining us. Much appreciated.